I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. There's a lot of things happening, as you say. It's sort of a, here's what's going to happen next, and you got to figure this out for yourself, irrespective of what you're doing. How do you position yourself for this future? What's the right way to think about it? But starts with having a framework. But you know, it's not just entrepreneurs that need to change their playbook. Everybody needs to change their playbook because company is about to go through massive transformations in the next 10 years. And so you're sitting there and you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, how can I get involved? How can I either start a company or how can I improve my life? What can I do listening to this? And what should I start looking at? You know, Steve Case was such a great podcast to do. I mean, I followed his career for well over 25 years, ever since he first started running AOL. And he was such a genius at building AOL into an internet empire. And then he made essentially the deal of the century when he sold it to Time Warner at the peak of you know the IPO internet bubble. And his analysis of future, his ability to predict is just un precedented, which is what we talked about on my podcast. Just such a great, a great episode. I was so proud to be interviewing him. I remember, for instance, Steve telling me how Bill Gates wanted to buy AOL and how Steve said no. And then when I asked him why, he told me that the simple answer is I really believed in the idea of the internet and I believed in AOL and I believed that it could change the world. I also remember him telling me how he struggled for a decade before he finally broke through. I think this is a really great podcast for anybody who wants to get into the mind of a true forward thinker, entrepreneur, billionaire. I'm proud to re-release this episode. So I've got Steve Case right here in the studio. Steve Case, the co-founder of AOL. Steve, how's it going? It's going great. It's been been a fun week. Now, I just finished your new book, The Third Wave. It's excellent. I really like, and we were just discussing this, I really like how you interwove kind of the past, the whole history of AOL, and really kind of the the, the rise of the consumer internet, but you, you interwove that with what's coming next, which is what I'm really interested in. And uh, it was great to see both sides of that, particularly given your, your history. But I'm just curious, here we are in Manhattan. You're a block away from Time Warner, the company that you were the chairman of at one point. Do you feel any um, nostalgia passing the building? Like, oh man, I wish I was still chairman of the company. No, not really. It was a, it was a, it's a similar to AOL when I visit them either in Dallas or, or here in New York. Uh, there's, it's always going to be part of my life. I started you know, AOL 31 years ago when uh, I was kind of a kid in my 20s. And uh, you know, so it was a great you know, journey. But when we did the merger now, 15, 16 years ago, I stepped aside as CEO. 
I was chairman for a couple of years and stepped aside. It, was just, it seemed like the right thing to do. And, and I've had a great time over the last 10 or 15 years, kind of, uh, kind of working both on the investment side, the investment firm we have called Revolution, and well, well on the philanthropic side with the Case Foundation. So, no, I don't really go back and say woulda, coulda, shoulda, or or or, or miss it. That was a great adventure, uh, and uh, the team we had did a great job of kind of trying to take the idea of the internet and make it part of everyday life. But uh, I'm I'm now happy to be you know focused on what's next, which is obviously part of the reason I wrote this book. Yeah, and I, I want to um, I want to dive into the book and, and into revolution because it's they're they're related because you're really investing a lot in the principles you describe in this book ranging from the internet of everything to impact investing and so on. I want to um, first talk a little bit about the the past just because y- you're, I don't even know, I mean, I'm sure you realize, but you're really a historical mm-hmm. person. I mean, at one point, half of the internet was going through AOL. Like, right. And as you even mentioned in the book, AOL was Facebook, Twitter, you know, Google all rolled up into one as AOL at the time. Right. Like everybody was using it for everything. I mean, I was on AOL I am for instance all day long every day so mm-hmm. so there is a, a history to be sure. addressed here and you 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 were I think it kind of establishes your credentials as a visionary going forward how um, much of a visionary you were back in like 1987 88 89 and so on before the consumer internet was was really here and I'll I just I'll mention one thing I remember I was a grad graduate student at the time and uh, using Usenet which was the you know message sure. boards before the World Wide Web and I remember what a horrible thing it was when suddenly you released all of AOL's users onto Usenet. Yeah, it I really felt that. like, oh my God, we're, we've been invaded. I mean, it even felt like we're, we're all plotting to start an internet too, to just have our own place again. But, you know. No, I remember that. And actually, Walter Isaacson is a friend, I know a friend of yours too, and wrote the forward for the book, talks about that in the forward, sort of when kind of AOL opened the doors to its customers to connect to the internet. But our view then, and, and it's still my view now, is we wanted to democratize access. We want everybody to be included. We wanted to level the the playing field. And so we recognized there were some, you know, internet netizens, as they oh, yeah, were we called, who were like, like, oh, you know, like, oh, we just keep our little neighborhood to ourselves. Thank you very much. We don't want the, you know, the, the average folks coming in here, the riffraff. But we thought it was important that the internet be available to everybody, which is why we worked so hard to make it easy to use and useful and fun and affordable so everybody could use it, everybody could connect. Uh, and it took us a while, as I say in the book, when we got started in 1985, only 3% of people were online and they were only online one hour a week. So when we said we wanted to get America online, we were, we were serious and it was a, it was a hard struggle for, for you know, a decade really before we finally uh, broke through uh, and uh, uh, telling some of those you know, stories as part of this book, you know, it was kind of fun to, you know, go back 30 plus years and remember where we were and to see how far we've come, but also to try to project where we might be going next. Well, well, and you were a classic David and Goliath story because there was, there was CompuServe and Prodigy and, and you may or may not have seen kind of the, the billion internet providers that were just coming five years later. Right. Uh, but, and you were the small guy out of CompuServe, Prodigy and, and AOL. I mean, they were backed by huge, you know, companies like IBM, Sears, H&R Block. Right. Uh, so scary. how did you, what What were kind of the, um, A, reasons you thought, hey, we could overcome these guys and get bigger, and B, what were you think were the critical decisions that allowed you to become bigger than them? Well, the first, when we was first started looking at this in the in the early 80s, it was kind of dominated by the, the big guys. Now, dominated is kind of a weird word because not many more people were online, but there were big companies, as you mentioned, Prodigy, IBM, and Sears had committed a billion dollars to to launch that, which is pretty, uh, you know, pretty scary. And, and you had and, no big company behind you. No. And, uh, you know, at the time, CompuServe, as you mentioned, was owned by H&R Block, something called The Source, was owned by Reader's Digest. Knight Ritter had a service called Butron, AT&T, and Citibank. Everybody was doing different uh, different tests. So this little company in, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, uh, origi- originally called Quantum Computer Services, then called uh, yeah, obviously AOL, uh, was kind of the you know the the David going up against the Goliaths. And it, it's funny to think back now, given what's happened with startups and funding of startups. But our first round of venture capital, we raised one million dollars, and over seven years, we raised ten million dollars when we went public. In 1992, it was the first internet company to go public. We raised $10 million in the IPO. And public at a $70 million valuation, and only, what was it, like nine years later, eight years later, $163 billion valuation. Right. 
No, it was, it was, it was, no, it was, no it was, other company in history has ever. Well, had it was the best performing stock of the decade, and so it was. But it was funny because when we went public, it wasn't just that we didn't raise much money and the valuation was low. I remember the roadshow. We're talking to institutional investors, and they looked at us like we're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? You know, this this internet thing. Why would why would normal people ever want to get connected to this thing? Uh, so of course we take it for granted now. But in those early you know, days, of the, what I think of as sort of the first wave of the internet. It was tough. You know, most people were skeptical and, and it was kind of expensive to get online at the time, like often $10 an hour. It was kind of hard to get online. The software was really complicated. Most people didn't have PCs. The few who did didn't have modems. Remember back then, you had to go to the peripheral section of the computer store to get this right. thing called a modem. Uh, it wasn't much once you got online. There wasn't much content there. There wasn't much community because there was nobody online to talk to. It, it, it took a while for that really to you know, to take off. And thankfully, the team we had at AOL really stuck with it and, and persevered. And finally, after a decade, it, we kind of became this kind of almost decade, the making overnight sensation. Well, it really is kind of like that that whole notion of, oh, of course, AOL made it. They were in the right place at the right time. But it really was. I mean, you see in the book, all the issues and problems you had along the way that you had to solve, right? everything ranging from outages to marketing issues to all these, to Bill Gates, doing his classic summoning you to his office right. saying, you know, either join us or we're going to crush you. Right. So how does it feel it's now? intimidating. Yeah. yeah. Like, so, so you were like up against Bill Gates back then. And now you guys, I'm going to call you elder statesman for lack of a better word, but now you're doing these charitable ventures together. Like, what do you guys talk about now? <laughs> No, we have actually. You call very, each other on the phone, like, "Hey." No, Bill. we have a very good relationship, but we did we did duke it out. There's no question that uh, that uh, it was a tough, you know, in particularly in that '90s time frame. But uh, Microsoft, very powerful company, and Windows was a very powerful franchise. Uh, and when they said they were going to integrate their own online service, that's what we called it back then, not the internet. They were going to integrate something called the Microsoft Network with every copy of of Windows would so be on every you know PC in the in in the in the world. Uh, it was kind of scary. And so, uh, you know, we were nervous. Some of our investors, frankly, and board members thought we, we should, you know, kind of fold our tent and, and and sell to Microsoft, call it a day, because they were pretty scared of what was coming. But well, thankfully, Why we, didn't you do that? Like, I feel like if someone offered me, I don't know what it would have meant to you, like $10, $20 million, and I was a young guy, like, of course I would have, or even if I was an old guy, I, I would take it. Like, why did you well, feel this, like, this oh, was, I'm going to go for the billion? Well, this was, uh, well, the answer, simple answer is we really believed in the idea of the internet and believed in, in, in AOL and believed that it could change the world and believed we could build a significant, you know, valuable company. And so uh, we, we, we just it felt like there was still, we'd been working hard for the better part of a decade. When we, I was talking to Bill, I think it was probably 93 or 94. Uh, and so we'd been at it, you know, since almost a decade. Uh, and uh, we'd gone public in 92, so it was a public company. It was worth a few hundred million dollars at the time. He never got to the point where he offered a, a price, but it would have been something under a billion dollars, and, and th there were some investors that thought it made sense. I didn't, and, and, and thankfully, you know, I won that by one vote. <laughs> it was, you know, there was, it was a close, close call, and as you mentioned, uh, six, seven years later, uh, it had gone from a few hundred million dollars to you know, you know, tens, of, uh, tens of billions to then you know, over 100, 150, 160 billion. Uh, and so you know, I think then the investors were, board members were all glad that we hadn't sold. And and so again, what do you think, um, what do you think that we're, and this is ben of benefit to any entrepreneur listening, you know, MSN of course was the Microsoft network and had, had the backing of the biggest company in the world, biggest software company in the world. It was on a desk of every computer. What do you think were the critical factors that ultimately catapulted AOL beyond that and MSN was basically a failure? Well, it was it was a classic case of of sort of you call it David and Goliath, but also sort of this battle between attackers and defenders. And, the, and what I learned, particularly as AOL got larger, and even uh, after the merger with Time Warner, as we kind of shifted from being an attacker, the disruptor, to being more of the defender, kind of protecting the the status quo. And and the bigger companies tended to you know to focus on how do you extend their current businesses. So companies like Prodigy, you know, the the Sears or a key partner, thought of it mostly around shopping, electronic shopping. Uh, now we, we call e-commerce. So you know, a, a company like AT and T thought about mostly about you know communications and uh, and you know, so everybody, you know, a, Citibank was thinking most about banking. And Knight Rider was thinking most about content. And so they all came at this new opportunity, kind of looking at the rearview mirror, kind of a little bit uh, imprisoned by their own you know past. We had at AOL, you know, the opportunity as a startup to really look at it, you know, with a clean slate and say it was almost what, like the big companies were holding them back in some ways by their corporate culture being imposed on the smaller startup. Right. They, they were they were basically 
imposing a, a large company culture on a small, you know, kind of startup team. That, that was part of it. But also we're imposing a set of presumptions and hypotheses based on their own experiences that this new thing would look sort of like their old thing. And so, you know, the, the, not surprisingly, if you're a newspaper company like, you know, New York Times or, or Knight Ritter or something like that, that or, or, or Time Inc. You'd, you're on the magazine side, you'd think of this as more like an electronic newspaper. And you'd presume that the, the key thing that would drive adoption would be content. Uh, well, we didn't have that view. We had the view that, that the killer app was going to be people, was going to be what we called community. Uh, now we think of it more as, as social media. Uh, and so we kind of went all in on, on community. We created things like, like chat rooms, people connection. We created things like instant messaging and, and buddy lists and things like that uh, because we really believed that that was really kind of the soul of the medium and, and ultimately would be the, you know, the, the core of, the, of, of, the, of, of the medium. And it turned out right at, 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 uh, at our, our peak. About almost half of all the internet traffic in the United States went through AOL and more than half of our use was these community you know, features. So having that startup mentality and really saying, you know, how do we break through what's going to really drive this uh, and, you know, and and sort of have a view of that anything is possible and not be overly constrained by by the, you know, kind of the perspectives of a larger company uh, was helpful. Part of the reason that I wrote the book was to provide some of those lessons for entrepreneurs, but frankly, also some of those lessons for larger company executives. I think there are opportunities in this, in this third wave uh, for big companies to disrupt themselves, but if they bring a cautious, conservative, kind of um, you know, view of it and, and don't you know, get the right people and empower them in the right ways, they are going to be left, left behind. Well, that's really interesting because as you saw through the 90s and even in the early 00s, like the idea of a large company imposing their culture on the startup culture is it's almost like you can't get away from that. Like when you, and we'll, I want to talk about the third wave and how companies can use that and, and individual entrepreneurs can use that. But when you even merged with Time Warner, I mean, technically, your market cap was bigger, so it was AOL absorbing Time Warner. But ultimately, Time Warner did impose their culture on AOL, and and it was too much. Like it right. was overwhelming. That that whole media centric culture, the internet as a newspaper, and so on. And now, you know, you discussed the first wave as like Internet 1.0, the 90s. Maybe the second wave was the social media go and the app store and mobile right. and so on. Now. I think there's a lot of questions of what, about what's coming next, and you discuss it as as the Internet of Everything, which which overrides what people call the Internet of Things. Maybe discuss what is the Internet of Everything. How did we kind of get to this point? We got to this point. The way I I think of it is the first way really was about building the internet uh, and building awareness of the internet, and it was hard. As I as I said, it was really a decade to you know get traction. It required building the networks, building the software, and building the services, and you know, a lot of stuff and a lot of different partnerships to kind of create it. You know, that is a consumer kind of phenomenon, uh, and not just have the on ramps, but educate people why they should get on. Uh, which again seems kind of crazy now to talk about it, but for the better part of a decade, it wasn't just about building it; it was about evangelizing why people should be connected. So that really was the whole first wave, just building the internet. The second wave has been building on top of the internet. And it has, as you mentioned, been about apps and services and Facebook and Twitter and, and Snapchat and Waze are kind of, you know, classic examples of that in the in the second wave. It's really been about the software. It's really been about the app. It's really been about, you know, viral, trying to drive viral adoption. And there will continue to be opportunities like that. But in the third wave, it, it's going to really be the next step, which is integrating the internet in seamless, pervasive, ubiquitous ways across our lives. And in the process, I think, really revolutionizing things like how we learn and, and how we stay healthy and how we move around and how we manage energy and even you know, how we eat. And so big sectors of, of our lives, big sectors of the economy are up for grabs. And, and the question is how much of that comes from, you know, the, the innovation comes from the entrepreneurs, the upstarts, the attackers, and how much comes from the larger companies, the incumbents, the, the defenders. And I think time will tell. But I do think it's, a, it, it's going to require a different mindset for both an entrepreneurs and, and corporate executives. And that's why I kind of lay out the, a framework in, in this book. And, and some of it builds on some of the lessons I, I learned as both an entrepreneur in the first wave and an investor in the second wave. But historically, and, and as you saw, it seems like, again, the large companies, they almost become bureaucracies unto themselves. Like they get so uh, indoctrinated in their culture, for better or for worse, because focus was important for them at some point while they were building. And 
you know, it's always startups. Like you have a, a great uh, graphic in the book where job creation really comes from the startups right. as opposed to the older companies. They're trying to now do find efficiencies and do layoffs and so on. Whereas the startups are all by definition are hiring people because they're starting up and hiring people. Right. So how do you, um, you know, how can uh, a, a corporate CEO or, or let's say even middle management executive uh, start to say, hey, we should try, um, I don't know, putting internet chips on the food to keep track of, you know, the quality of the meat and so on. Mm -hmm. Like who's going to want to sort of take that chance and, and spend that money and do that? Well, I think the smart uh, large companies will recognize that they don't lean into the future. They don't take some chances. They're going to going to lose their way. I remember one of the most iconic companies when I was growing up was Eastman Kodak. Everybody knew Kodak because it was so dominant in photography. Well, they're now bankrupt. And the reason they're bankrupt is they lost their way in the digital photography revolution. But the odd thing, the surprising thing, in some ways the shocking thing, is they actually invented digital photography, Kodak. Uh, but then the corporate executives were more focused on playing defense, selling chemicals and papers, and which were pretty lucrative at the time. So they didn't really invest in digital photography, didn't want it to happen quickly. And you know, they got left behind with a whole I mean, slew of new companies that emerged that not only led the way, but led the way to the point where Kodak went out of business. Well, and so that is, I think, a, a good lesson for uh, for these larger companies. How do you think about the you know, the future? How do you kind of lean into the future? How do you attract people within your company and create the right culture environment around innovation collaboration within your company? But in particular, how do you build a network around your company? It's not so much the people within your company, it's the other people around your company, including entrepreneurs. So how do you partner with entrepreneurs? Instead of fearing them, embrace them, and figure out ways to leverage some of their insights, some of their technology, some of their, their products and services. Uh, and I think in the third wave, there'll be more of that opportunity. I think the bigger companies will be more in tune about the benefits of partnering with entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneurs will start seeing the benefits of partnering with these larger companies. Because it's not like the second wave about the software, it's about the app. You know, the, Facebook didn't really need partners and Snapchat didn't really need partners. They just needed to launch a cool app and, and hope it struck a, a core with lots of people. And obviously it did. But if you're really going to revolutionize healthcare, you kind of have to partner with hospitals and, and doctors. If you want to revolutionize learning, you kind of have to partner with, with schools. And so it's going to require more, more partnerships in the third way, which will kind of force the entrepreneurs to embrace the idea of partnership, but also force the large organizations, whether it be nonprofits or, or, or corporations, to figure out ways to embrace the entrepreneurs. And that dance is going to be one of the important aspects of this third wave. You know, it's interesting. You bring up the Kodak example, and you you bring up a quote that uh, I guess it was the CEO or no, one of the main guys, who, the guy who discovered the digital camera, said, uh, "Oh, it'll be about twenty years before the right. digital photography is mainstream." Which is, in retrospect, now was a short time because now they're bankrupt. But at the time, they probably were listening to that and figure, "Okay, we'll deal with this later." I think a lot of large companies don't see the exponential effect of these rising technologies, sort of the Moore's law effect that these tech, like digital photography might've started off small, but if something's doubling every year, it's going to get big suddenly so fast at the, it's going to reach this tipping point where it'll be so fat, big, so fast, we'll be too late. And the entrepreneurs who are right there at that point won't be too late. And I think that's what happened with AOL versus like an H and R block say. I think that's right. And even with AOL, there were companies that we were talking to and partnering with uh, that were intrigued with what was happening. Uh, but, I thought the market was still kind of small, kind of niche, kind of hobbyisty. And AOL well, at the time was still, you know, pretty small. They said, well, let's keep an eye on this thing. And if it ever really gets real momentum, we'll go buy it. You know, it, it, it sort of just seems like it's still kind of early stage. We, we should, you know, we should monitor it, but we shouldn't, you know, be overly kind of, you know, focused on it. And of course, once we did hit our stride, the growth accelerated so quickly and the valuation accelerated so quickly, that was no longer... An option, and so I think that is, a, I think, a lesson you know I've learned for you know in terms of big companies. How do you make sure you're really are thinking about the future and don't presume it's going to be you know you know twenty years down the road? I mean, it may, some of these things will take some time to kind of bake in the oven, but once there is clear evidence and momentum that a, a new company, a startup, has a better idea, uh, the the support they'll get from investors and, and employees and partners really can accelerate that. An example I, I mentioned in the book is, you know, Airbnb is now a huge hospitality company with a, with a market cap of, it's private, but roughly $25 billion. They didn't exist a decade ago. You know, Hilton and Marriott have both been around a half a century. Uh, and and they're now worth less than Airbnb. And I have no doubt that the executives at Hilton and and Marriott, when Airbnb came, first came on the scene, they said, "What's this? This is silly. I mean, you know, who's really gonna rent out like an air mattress in their in their apartment or rent out a room in their apartment? This is like a 
ridiculous idea. Uh, and of course, Airbnb struck a chord and expanded into other things. So, you know, you can rent a whole apartment or, or even some, you know, vacation homes. Uh, and suddenly that went from a dumb idea that was never, never had a shot to being a, you know, idea that really has significant, you know, momentum. And now, for example, Airbnb has far more hotel rooms or virtual hotel rooms, people, places people can stay in Cuba, for example, than all the hotel companies combined. You know, company it, didn't exist a decade ago. So it's, it, these things can happen faster than the larger, you know, kind of incumbent players, you know, think, and they have to be monitoring what's happening. And the best way to do that is to, to partner with entrepreneurs in some kind of win-win way. And yet, and yet, like the Airbnb is a great example. Uh, that's just in the past few years. So it's not like things have changed. They're still, it's like the same old that you experienced in the nineties that people experienced in the OOs, you know, of 1900. So, so, okay. So talk about the internet of everything. Like what are, what are some of the most, what is it? What are some of the most amazing things you've seen with it? You have a lot of examples in the book, but I'd like to hear you talk about it. Well, I think there are a bunch of different sectors, but the you know, the core idea is that it's going to, the internet and technology is going to become really uh, pervasive and ubiquitous. And so it's not going to just be in a, in a few places like we saw in the first wave and the second wave sectors like communications and media being, being uh, disrupted. It's going to really impact really every aspect of our, our lives. So it starts with that theme. And then, so how does technology, how does the internet improve the way we deliver health so that we have uh, kind of better health outcomes with more convenience at lower cost? If you go to a doctor's office now, it's, you know, it's about the same as what 20 years ago. You, you, would, you would not know that there has been an internet revolution if you, if you walk into your, your doctor. There's some examples in some places where that's not the case, but the vast majority of people, nothing is nothing is uh, changed. Similarly, you, you, you're right though. Like like paperwork is all over the place. They have the same Manila folders with my patient records. Why it seems like there have been a lot of companies that tried to kind of mm -hmm. uh, consolidate all that into software and networking. Why has that not occurred yet? Like, why can't they? Because doctors' offices maybe are so uh, segmented. Maybe that's why there's too many partnerships to happen. Well, I think that's part of the my you know whole theme of the third wave. A, it's it's hard. And it's going to take time. So perseverance is, is important. You know, B, you can't go alone. You need to you need to partner. And for the startups to partner with these larger organizations to kind of get their foot in the door with uh, United Health or or Cleveland Clinic or. Uh, Mayo or others, it's hard because, you know, it's hard to figure out a way to get in. It's hard to figure out a way to establish that partnership. There are a lot of interesting technologies, interesting products, services that just don't get traction because they're not able to get those kind of partnerships. And, the, and, and the partnerships third, is a key part of huge. how an entrepreneur can succeed now in this third wave as opposed to second wave and first wave. Well, I'd say the first wave partnerships were important. You know, and part of part of what my reason I wrote the book is some of the, I realized some of the things that were important in the first wave weren't important particularly important in the in the second wave but will be important again in the third wave so partnerships were critical for us we wouldn't have not gotten off the ground without uh, partnerships perseverance was important it took us as i mentioned a, a decade and policy was important engaging with with government because the government helped and create the and fund the internet and, and figure out when and how to commercialize the internet and figure out how to break up the phone companies to unleash competition and telecommunications that enabled you know the internet. You know their government played an important role in getting that that going. Not so much in the in the in the second wave when it was more about apps, but it's going to become important again in the in the third wave. And ties back to your healthcare question. Even some of the things that were in the Affordable Care Act that was passed by by the Congress is unleashing some of the innovation and in, in, in technology requiring uh, electronic medical records to be adopted and, and providing some funding for doctors' offices to. To do that, so I, I think that's the lesson to me is that that you know, entrepreneurship in this third wave is going to require a different mindset and a different playbook, and things like perseverance are going to matter more. Things like partnerships are going to matter more. Things like perseverance are going to matter more. And it wasn't that important those three Ps in the second wave. It was in the first wave, which is why I, you know some of the stories I tell about the early days with AOL, the early days of the first wave, is I do that because I think it helps inform entrepreneurs, innovators thinking about the third wave because they're, you know, Shakespeare once wrote us the past is prologue. And I think that's true as we think about the third wave. And so, so again, what do you see as some of the, um, I mean, you mentioned healthcare. What are some companies you've seen now that have just like blown your mind in terms of how they're using this next phase of the internet? And again, just to be clear, this next phase of the internet is not just about connecting people. It's about connecting everything. It's like, for instance, I'll just give a basic example, uh, a traffic light, seeing that you're speeding and then sending that signal to the police headquarters, then you get mailed the ticket and so on. This is, this is all now going through the internet. It's not like these disparate 
uh, pieces of software. They're all, it's all happening on one platform. And, and again, not just about connecting humans, but connecting things. Right, exactly. And the whole Internet of Things is really about devices and sensors, both in terms of things consumers might have with them, as well as things that are in enterprises, and even things that are built into infrastructure in cities, the whole idea of smart cities that a lot of companies are What does a smart city mean? On. Smart city basically means you can figure out ways to know where people are and where people are going in a way that allows you to be smarter in terms of managing you know, things like, uh, you know, lights when people are driving their 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 car or having a better planning in terms of how many you know people you need to be ready for on that you know subway or you know if you do have a, a challenge some kind of crisis and need to move people around what are smarter ways to to move people around and these things are, are you know are tricky and actually sometimes a little scary there can be a little bit it's of a big issue. brother aspect to it and uh, and a privacy aspect to it and i think that's why more dialogue is going to be important in this in this third way between the, the innovators and sort of the, the policy makers but going back to some specifics of the third wave and healthcare there's really three parts of healthcare you know what do we do to stay healthy you know how do we manage chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes and how do we deal with with life-threatening disease and there are dozens of startups in each of those three areas that are doing interesting things on this how do we stay healthy uh, there's some some wearable devices fitbit obviously become popular now a successful you know public uh, company but there are dozens of people doing things Things like that, dozens of, of of new ideas that are out there in terms of the wellness side of things. How do you keep people healthy? Dozens of companies that are doing things around chronic managing chronic disease. The way most people manage things like diabetes hasn't really changed in in, in decades. And there are a lot of innovative things that are happening, uh, and a lot of accelerators and incubators just focused on 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 that, including. You know, Rock Health, uh, it's been one of the ones that's been you know, quite successful. And similarly, on the, on, the, on the third piece, how do you be more targeted about things? Right now, if you go to one of the most successful, largest kind of cancer you know, centers in the, in, the, in the country, MD Anderson, they say 25% of all diagnoses are, are wrong. You know, they, they don't get it right the first time. Not MD Anderson, but when people come to MD Anderson for a second opinion, you know, 25% of the time they reverse the opinion that was originally given. That's amazing because, of course, his basic advice is always get a second opinion. I didn't and really that's know that's why you need to get a big. second opinion. And, and some of that is because, particularly if you're in hospital in some, you know, rural area, they don't have a particular sophistication about brain cancer or something else. Uh, they're they're going to take a shot at it. They're going to obviously do the best they can, but they don't have the tools. They don't have the expertise. Uh, and so going to, you know, centers of excellence where they do have that, it, it, it changes. And then you can, you know, do some things with, with you know, DNA now that allow you to be more precise in terms of what drugs work and don't work. Most drugs pe most people take actually don't work for them. They work for some people, but they don't work for everybody. Uh, and we kind of have this kind of one-size-fits-all kind of approach. So there's just going to be enormous innovation in, 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 in healthcare. I also think there's going to be enormous innovation in education. There are obviously a lot of things have happened in the first wave and the second wave around different learning and a lot of apps and AOL had a, had, had a, had a role in, in, in some of that. But the reality is for most kids in most classrooms and most parts of the country, despite the fact they have computers in the classroom in, 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 in many places, the process of learning is about the same as it was. Uh, yet most kids learn differently. They don't all learn the same. Uh, and teachers, if they have a better sense of how different kids are are doing in terms of a different you know kind of lessons and and can customize things in a more personalized, adaptive way using you know, technology, I think that'd be helpful. Similarly, in the universities, or a lot of universities are now you know testing the idea of flipped classrooms. That maybe instead of having the professor stand at the front and give the same lecture they've been giving for decades, uh, they actually tape that and you watch the video in your dorm the night before and you come to class, you actually have a discussion with the professor and your, and your you know, fellow students. And so how do you have a much more interactive discussion around, around the, you know, the topics and how do you use technology to enable that more kind of adaptive, personalized approach to, to learning? So there's just, there's, there are innovative things that have been happening around the edges, but most of these sectors of, of the economy and frankly, most of these important aspects of our lives haven't changed that much in the in the first wave or the second wave but i think they are going to change in in this third wave and the entrepreneurs are going to lead the way as they always do kind of challenging the status quo and and kind of you know pushing pushing ahead but there's also a role particularly in these sectors uh for partnerships with some of the big companies already there and and dialogue with governments who are going to be involved as as, as as regulators in some cases customers and some of these sectors i know some entrepreneurs don't want to hear that because it's kind of scary to think about partnerships it's hard also, to think about it's, partnerships it's scary to, to think about government it's very you hard down. to talk to the government like you it can't, is very hard you can't call them up and say hey i'd like to meet the czar of the internet of everything like there is none correct <laughs> and, and, and so it's be frustrating and then again this is part of the motivation to 
to write the book. It sort of lays out a framework for what I think will play out in the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, and some thoughts on why that will happen the way it will, but also some ideas on how entrepreneurs need to change their playbook, how corporate executives need to change their playbook, and how government regulators need to change their playbook. Everybody needs to dance a little different dance in this, in this third wave. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like The key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. 
boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Powered by Snapdragon, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra elevates your photography to epic new heights. Snapdragon processors deliver a color experience like no other with sharp, industry-leading 8K video capture. You can also snap images in 200 megapixels, capturing more detail than ever. And those late-night blurry pics are a thing of the past thanks to next-level night mode. Experience powerfully moving premium photography only with Snapdragon. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official. But you know, it's not just entrepreneurs that need to change their playbook. It's basically everybody needs to change their playbook because if you're sitting in a cubicle listening to this, for instance, your company is about to go through massive transformations in the next 10 years. And so you're sitting there and you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, how can I get involved? How can I either start a company or how can I improve my life? What can I do listening to this? And what should I start looking at? What are kind of areas where maybe uh, entrepreneurs to be should start looking at? Well, it's a great point. I think everybody kind of has to bring a kind of an entrepreneurial what's going to happen next mindset. And everybody needs to really try to do the best they can to manage their own career. You know, when I was, you know, kind of coming out of college, you know, the, the history was like my dad had one job, worked for one company for 60 years. You know, I worked for several companies. You worked for Procter & Gamble and Pizza Hut. I worked Procter <laughs> & Gamble and Pizza, then Control Video, a startup that then kind of morphed into, into, into AOL. So I had three jobs in three years. My parents thought I would completely kind of, you know, gone nowhere fast. Well, now there's some people who have three jobs with three different companies in the same day. You know, the whole gig economy. They might right. work for Uber, then Lyft, and then, you know, Instacart or, or, or what have you. So the notion of work has changed. Now, 34% of Americans are freelancers, uh, either freelancing on specific projects for companies, and, and maybe they have a half a dozen different, you know, different organizations they work with, or some cases like the gig economy, freelancing for you know, a variety of folks in the same week or even the in the same day. So the whole idea of work is, is you know, even the even the, the government reports job statistics every every month, but it's, it hasn't really changed in a half a century, even though the nature of work has changed in a half century. So there's a lot of things happening, as you say. It's not just about it's part. You know, the book is not intended to be just a business book. It's sort of a here's what's going to happen next, and you got to figure this out for yourself, irrespective of what you're you're doing. How do you position yourself? For this future, what what what's the right way to think about it? But starts with having a framework, and I, I should say that even the title of the third wave, I didn't come up with. I I read a book when I was in college by Alvin Toffler called The Third Wave uh, in 1980, and I was mesmerized by it. He kind of laid out a framework for what's going to happen next, and I I thought it made sense. And and he talked at the time about the electronic cottage and other things. Again, the internet it didn't exist then. It was not available to consumers. It took a decade after that book was written before it even was legal to connect consumers or businesses to the internet. Mm. Uh, so it was, it was very futuristic. You know, uh, but uh, I read that Toffler Third Wave and I, I, I just knew it was going to happen. And that then gave me a framework uh, in terms of what was going to happen over the next 10 or 20 years, which led me to want to not just kind of take the traditional corporate path, but do something that was more entrepreneur, which ultimately led me with, with, with two others to co-found AOL in, in, in 1985. I don't think that would have happened without reading The Third Wave. So part of my goal with writing this book and part of my reason to even name it The, you know, the Third Wave was to you know, show some appreciation for how Toffler inspired me. Uh, and I was, you know, was kind enough to read the book and provide some, some comments on it and what they call in the publishing world, as you know, a blurb for it. So for me, it was a little bit of kind of closing that that that, that circle. But I'm hopeful there's somebody out there, maybe listening to this podcast, who who can get the same inspiration from my third wave that I got from the Toffler third wave now nearly 40 years ago. Well, it's interesting because AOL obviously was a was you know a great business, like you said, half the internet's traffic grew to a 150 billion dollar uh, valuation. But then what happened was many smaller companies using that and the internet as a platform were created 
with, you know, with nice exits of 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, and so on. And I kind of see what you're suggesting here is that there's going to be the internet of everything, the platform sort of created already in some sense, just by the, you know, the fact that the networking is pervasive, the internet is pervasive, but now there's lots of smaller opportunities to create these niche companies in these different spaces, healthcare, food, transportation, and so on. So, and you, you actually mentioned one company that I thought was fascinating because you don't need tech technological expertise to make money. It's the, um, company where teachers, uh, pay for each other's curriculums. Right. So what was that? Was Teachers for Pay? What was that uh, company? It was basically a, a company that, that had the idea that every teacher is is kind of making up their own curriculum, making up their own syllabus, making up their own own coursework. Why don't you create a platform where everybody can post their stuff, uh, and then the, you know, the people can share it, or in this case, they actually pay something so that the lesson plan you created or the course material you created could be available by by to, to other people. And so it was a it's the idea of creating essentially a marketplace for content for for teachers and it's, we, it's an amazing way for teachers to get involved in this gig economy because teachers don't make these huge salaries but you mentioned four millionaires have come out of this platform so far and you're going to see a lot more of those kind of things there's enormous education innovation happening and a lot of it frankly is coming from teachers i saw this i do these rise of the rest bus tours around the country because i my belief is well there's great things happening in in silicon valley in new york and boston and sort of the the usual places there are also great things happening in cities all across the country and that dynamic around the rise rest will build steam, I think, in the in the in the third wave for a whole host of reasons. But one of the cities that there's enormous innovation around education uh, is New Orleans. And the reason is 10 years ago, New Orleans, as everybody knows, got devastated by Katrina. It really almost wiped the city out. A lot of people have left. All the schools had to shut down. Uh, and in, in some ways, it turned out to, in an odd way, to be a blessing because something like 70% of the schools at the time were had failing grades. Uh, but they had to restart them, and and they ended up putting charter schools in place. Got thousands of people coming to New Orleans, including from Teach for America, and many stayed. And having that experience of, of teaching now have a better sense of what teachers need and what students need. And there are dozens of ed tech startups now in in New Orleans. I talk about some examples in, in in the book. So this is a great example of people who are close to the problem or they understand the problem. In this case, the environment with with classroom who are figuring out ways to be, be their own entrepreneurs, create startups to solve some of those, those problems. We're seeing that not just in New Orleans, but Detroit and Pittsburgh and Kansas City and Nashville and Minneapolis and, and Des Moines. There's really innovation happening all across the country. And I think that's going to be one of the great phenomenons of this third wave. Right, and it's not just Silicon Valley. And in fact, even, um, even Mark Cuban has said the best thing you can do now is uh, invest outside of Silicon Valley and then sell your company to Silicon Valley because that's where the valuations are higher, but you can invest more cheaply outside of Silicon Valley. No, correct. I think I think there's great things happening in Silicon Valley. There are great things happening you know, here in New York, uh, but there's so much money chasing those companies. Valuations do tend to be quite a bit higher. Yet when the companies are successful and either get you know acquired or go public, Nobody says, oh, you're, you're like exact target, for example, is a company that's based in Indianapolis, Indiana, and, and Salesforce bought them for $3 billion. They didn't say, oh, you know, you're an exact target, you're only worth $2 billion because you're in Indianapolis. They say it's worth $3 billion. Or Under Armour, now a very successful kind of athletic wear company using technology, you know, worth $20, $25 billion and, and, and going after Nike. They're in Baltimore, Maryland. You know, they're not, they're not, where would you think they would be? You know, nobody would guess they're in, in Baltimore. But when, and when they got started, Kevin Plank would, would say it was really hard to get started, really hard to raise the capital because people weren't funding startups in, in Baltimore. But now that they've been successful, there's a whole ecosystem, you know, building around Under Armour and other, other companies. And, and we're seeing this really all over the country. It's really something I'm very encouraged by because if people want to be in Silicon Valley, go for it. Uh, but if people want to be in Detroit because they want to be part of the rebirth of Detroit, maybe they're from Detroit, uh, now they can be in Detroit. And there's a startup scene in Detroit that didn't exist you know, 10 years ago and capital focused on startups in Detroit that didn't exist you know, 10 years ago. And the connection between this rise of the rest and the third wave, I think, is going to be quite interesting because many of the big sectors of the economy aren't in California and New York. Most of the 75% of Fortune 500 companies are in the middle of the country. And so if partnerships matter and you really want to revolutionize you know, farming, for example, you, know, you want to create an ag tech company, you, know, you could do that in, in San Francisco, you could do that in, in here in Manhattan, but you also could do that in, in Louisville, which has a great kind of farming ecosystem, or in St. Louis, companies like Monsanto are there. They have 100,000 PhDs who understand agriculture. I'll bet there are a bunch of startups that in the third wave of the next decade that that come out of Monsanto. There might be 100 
ag tech startups, you know, 10 years from now in, in St. Louis. And uh, they probably will be more successful because they have an understanding of that industry and they potentially could be partners with you know, existing players in the industry like a Monsanto. Well, it's interesting, you know, you're a great example of someone who didn't have experience in the area you became successful in. I mean, you were at Procter & Gamble, you were uh, director of marketing at Pizza Hut, and then suddenly you became the biggest internet guy out there. And what what should, let's say, I'm, again, I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, my gosh, this is going to be a trillion dollar opportunity. How can I get involved? What should I start? You know, obviously they should read the third wave, your book, to kind of see the outline of what's happening. What else, what do you read? Like, how do you kind of do your research in these areas? What should somebody read to kind of say, okay, now I'm, I'm getting equipped with the resources to, to go out there and do something? I think it's a mix of things. First, I think entrepreneurs are great, you know, pattern recognizers. They, they, they're paying attention to something and they're seeing some trends develop and they start connecting the dots and they say, ah, I, I see there's something there. So you have to be kind of looking at what's happening on the periphery. And it depends what your passion is. It depends what your area of focus is. You know, some people might say, I just want to be part of the, the revolution in food. It, it, it belief that big food companies are going to come under pressure because they generally are offering unhealthy options to people. I want to focus on that. Well, pay attention to what's happening in that sector. Follow the blogs. Go to the conferences. Walk, you know, have, follow people on Twitter that are doing innovative things in those in those places. And over time, you'll get a point of view about what's likely to happen, and you'll make some connections with some people. Maybe some of those people could join you in, in starting a company that can you know kind of take on that. And it could be true in any sector. So part of it's figuring out what what part of this you're most passionate about, you're most interested in, and then diving into it. And there is an interesting dynamic, and you kind of allude to it that sometimes. Sometimes the benefit of, of being an entrepreneur who doesn't have any experience in the industry is you can bring a fresh perspective. You don't have any kind of fixed ideas of what's going to happen. And that is true. And that does un enable a lot of different uh, innovation. But I think in the third wave, ignorance is not going to be as successful as a strategy or naivete is not going to be successful as a strategy because I do believe you know, that, that, that education, for example, there's a certain culture to it. If you don't understand what a teacher you know, is dealing with, you probably aren't going to be as successful in connecting with a teacher, similarly with a, with a doctor, similarly with a, with a chef. So there's some balance that's going to be required where you bring that naivete, that energy, that sense of possibility uh, that uh, somebody who doesn't understand the, the industry would, might have and, and marry that with and balance that with some understanding of the people and the cultures and the, and the perspectives. And so building the right teams in the third wave, I think is going to be very important. I've, I've learned entrepreneurship is a, is a team sports. One of the themes I really focus on in the, in, in the book, and it's going to require diverse perspectives. Uh, so you have some people who bring that technology engineering perspective. Some people bring that consumer marketing perspective. Some people bring that industry specific, whether it be health or learning or food or what have you, you know, perspective and make sure your team really has a, you know, the right mix of skills, the might right mix of, of perspectives. And so, so what, what, uh, books would you recommend they read today? Like starting now? You know what to inspire them to get them going. So again, the third wave, I highly recommend. It's a great. Well, thank you. It's your story mixed with your the ideas of the future. What's next? I th again, I think it really depends on your specific interests. There are a lot of great books on on, on entrepreneurship and technology uh, uh, trends, but I would encourage people to focus on some area of passion and, and say, you, you know, what what is the thing that over the next ten or twenty years you really want to focus on that you really have a sense that's going to change. You have a perspective on how it might change and dig into the, in a more specific way into some of those that might be reading books that might be reading blogs as it might be, you know, talking to people that might be going to conference, whatever it takes to become more familiar with what's happening in, in, in that sector, what some of the trends are, what some of the patterns that are starting to coalesce are. Uh, and I, as I said earlier, I think, I think if you're doing that, you will bump into people and ideas that will help give you, you know, clarity and give you some, and like some you said, guidance. give you a point of view. I think yeah, that's the critical thing. You have to have a point of view. And, and people you know, don't necessarily know on day one what that is because they, they don't know enough to be smart about it. Uh, so they, they, they occasionally you might just have a point of view that, that you just get lucky on. But more often, it's informed by some you know, interaction with other people and sometimes interaction with the, the marketplace, what we now call pivots. You set, thought, think this is going to work and it doesn't quite work. You try this and eventually you have a point of view of what's going to you know, gonna actually help. That was true with AOL. We... we it, we, it was like it really was a decade of trying this and trying that. The first the thing we tried failed miserably. I remember the, the, the I went to a board meeting. I was now twenty six years old, something like that. One of the 
venture capitalists, actually Frank Caulfield, who helped found Kleiner Perkins Caulfield Buyers, one of the largest, you know, most successful venture firms of the really the last half century. He was in that boardroom and said, geez, you'd have thought they would have shoplifted more than that. You know, the sales were so bad. Uh, and so that company, you know, was, was struggling. But from that, we created something where we were partnering with PC manufacturers, Commodore and Apple and Tandy and IBM to essentially create private label, what some people call kind of, you know, white label kind of online services. We did that for a few years. Uh, and then we had to pivot again, in part because Apple pulled out of the deal we had with them to create Apple Inc. And we had to figure out what to do next. And that led us to kind of rename Apple Inc. Personal Edition America Online and 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 then AOL and and then what we as we were talking about earlier we said we we're going to really focus more on uh, not on uh, on, on, the con on the community side not just content and and commerce and we really kind of doubled down on on that and then we're going to figure out a way to you know really attract lots of people which is when we came up with the idea of a free trial giving out lots of discs with a free month to get people you know lower the barrier to get them to try all those things were experiments over a decade. Some worked, some didn't work. We we just kept going, we kept persevering, and eventually we had a point of view that this was now about to take off, and that's when we kind of slammed down the accelerator, ex, you know, kind of you know, expanded our investment in partnership, expanded our investment in marketing, and and went from a couple hundred thousand you know, subscribers after seven or eight years to twenty five million subscribers seven or eight years later. It was when a that, point when, of view when that growth was happening. And obviously, both the growth of the company and the growth of your wealth and success and so on were happening. How did your life change? Like, how did you kind of um, uh, deal with all this this growth that was happening in your life? It was it was a challenge, but I always I think bring a kind of a even keeled perspective to it. You know, people would would uh, kind of sometimes joke about me as being kind of the shock absorber in the company. I try to. Kind of, kind of even things out a little bit. Sometimes people were overly optimistic. Sometimes even get cocky about you know kind of our position, and I'd remind them of some of the, uh, the you know competitive risks, and I'd sort of be delegating paranoia in that sense. And there are some years where people were giving up on us, and you know, people were kind of down and, and deflated. And I'd remind people, you know, why this is a journey, you know, that's important, a battle worth worth fighting to try to bring them back up. So I tried to kind of. You know, both for the company and for myself, kind of have a more even keeled approach that wasn't quite as you know big highs, big lows, but a little little more you know steady as as you go. But as it got bigger and it had uh, you know more success, it was a mix of you know, the challenge of running a company with thousands of people, not dozens of people, but also some you know real comfort and 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 uh, and. I felt great about the fact that we'd for a decade uh, had been believing this someday would happen, that someday we'd break through, someday we'd, people would understand the benefits of, of of getting connected. Finally, it was happening. And so this this dream we had that, that, that felt, felt elusive for a decade, it just seemed like, you know, it was going to happen someday, but, you know, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, but boy, that light seemed flickering and it seemed distant. Finally, you know, we had arrived. Finally, the internet was becoming something that, had mainstream success. So I think that the, the key lesson I try to communicate in this book is that perseverance matters. That it, there was many people that had this, had similar ideas that we had and, and tried different things, but gave up. They just said, this is not working. It, it, we we got to go do something else. Maybe go back to working for a, a safer kind of big company. But we, our team at AOL believed and we, we stuck with it and eventually we broke through. And, and then you made what is, in my view, clearly the smartest business transaction in history. I mean, you were understanding that the internet was not peaking as a technology, but was clearly at that time, 1999, peaking as uh, the stock market phenomenon at that moment. And so you went out and essentially acquired the largest media company in the world. I mean, they had 10 billion in profits versus your 1 billion in profits. They dwarfed you in terms of revenues, but because of your market position, you were able to acquire them rather than vice versa. And you had looked at other internet companies, but felt that was not diversification enough. But then people sort of took the reverse view that it was the worst transaction in history because they were looking at it from the Time Warner point of view and the short-term thinking of the stock market then. How were you feeling then? Like here you had been on top of the world a few years earlier and then suddenly the the media was like blasting right. you and AOL. It must have been painful at some point no, despite the success. It was painful. We had, we had, had a, you know, it was a, as I say, it was a tough decade to get going. Finally, the second decade, we had real traction, real momentum. I mean, kind of had arrived, and then a few years later, you know, things were in decline again, and so it was it was frustrating. And I, I learned a lot from that. And I think people learn from their challenges, their 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 problems, their failures more than they do from their 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 wins and successes. So I was pretty candid in the book about kind of what happened and why I think it happened, what some of 
the the takeaways for me were, but it, certainly it was painful. It was it was uh, you know, frustrating that we had we had worked so hard to get to this point, and then you know, kind of the air was coming out of the balloon, and and it was it was frustrating and disappointing. And what what do you think you you learned? Well, one is important to people and culture, that the idea of the merger with Time Warner, you mentioned sort of the financial diversification, which was true. I think we'd gone from a you know, $20 billion market cap to $160 billion market cap over two or three years. And there was, you know, at that point, we thought more downside risk than upside potential. And so merging with a company that had a, a much larger mix of businesses, I think in, 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 in total, as I recall, is about $40 billion of, of revenue. And as you say, ten billion of, of, of profit that that would create a diversity that you know in terms of a portfolio diversification would be good. But also strategically, we we thought it was valuable because it'd give AOL a path to broadband and give Time Warner a path to a strong digital future. So the idea of the merger made sense. Then I, th- I think it still made sense. The execution of the merger was terrible. And I, I often have cited and do in the book a Thomas Edison quote from a century ago: "Vision." Without execution is hallucination. You know, the vision of the merger, uh, you know, made sense. The execution didn't, and it ultimately came down to people and and and, and culture. That different people were thinking about things in different ways. Uh, there was a lot of animosity about you know the internet and, and about AOL. A lot of frustration about it. Uh, a lot, particularly after the market turned and the and the stock went went uh, went south, and people were were mad. And I understand that. Uh, but instead of doing something positive about it, which is to figure out how to capitalize on the assets under the, you know, the, under one roof, you know, there was a lot of you know infighting and and people kind of talking past each other. So the, to me, the key lesson is it goes back to you know kind of people and culture, and and I've tried to take some of those lessons and apply them to some of the companies we've invested in at Revolution, particularly as they scale. How do you make sure you get the the team culture right? How do you make sure you have the right people? on the bus, in the right seats, working together in the right way, all driving, you know, in the, in towards the same di- direction, which is easy to say, hard to do. Yeah, because uh, how do you get the culture right? Like, do you hire people different from you, sort of like Lincoln's team of rivals, or do you hire people with similar vision to you? Like, what do you... What do you do as you're kind of going from like 10 employees to 1,000 employees? It's a mix. I'd say it's sort of 10 to 50 to 100 to, you know, 250 to, to 1,000 to, you know, it, it, different, there are different steps and you do different things. And it's it tricky because it is a balance, just as you, you sort of say, you, you do need different perspectives. If you're just hiring people like you, you know, that don't really have different different views of things, you know, then you don't have a great team. Uh, at the same time, if you have people that have violently different, you know, opinions and particularly just think about business and think about teamwork or think about, you know, strategy in a, you know, a completely different way and you can't really figure out a way to kind of bring them together and drive collaboration, that doesn't work either. So it's a tricky balance be- between the two. How do you continue to kind of lean in the future, figure out what the company might look like a couple of years down the road and try to get the right team in place before you get to that place, not after you get to that place, uh, but do it with a sensitivity where you really want people that really are passionate about the, you know, the, the idea and, and have a shared vision of that idea, recognize that different skills, different perspectives are important and, and focus more on the team dynamic. Like how do we win this together? I, the other thing that I mentioned in the in the book is uh, the lesson I took away from now, it's over two decades ago, when the U.S. Olympic team in basketball was was these unbelievable athletes. And everybody said, you know, for sure, this dream team, they called it, was going to end up, you know, winning the, you know, the gold medal. And they lost relatively early to Lithuania. Uh, and the reason is, while they each had great skills, great talents as individual performers, they didn't play well as a team. They just were used to being kind of the stars on the in, on their own teams, and they weren't really focused on on the team dynamic, and ultimately got crushed. Uh, and so, to me, that uh, it's, it was another example that you got to get the right skills. You obviously got to get the right perspectives, and I think diversity of perspectives is going to become more important in the. In the third way, but you got to figure out a way to bring them together as as one team that has has one mission and is working together in a in a aligned kind of united way. Even though they bring different perspectives, ultimately when they lock into a plan, they all move, march ahead to execute that plan. You know, it's interesting because there was a study done recently about company all the companies from the '90s and who survived into the OOS. You know, after the internet crash. And some companies were identified as star culture companies where they like the dream team that hired stars and others were identified as commitment cultures where the focus was more on not necessarily growth or stars, but uh, how do we make sure we, how we, how do we focus on building a similar commitment like a family and to survive? 
100% of those companies survived and almost 100% of the star culture companies failed. Right. So it's interesting that the key thing was, you know, how do you build a, a kind of common commitment, even if it's a diverse set of values and, and so on. And I think the, the, a good example, the evolution of this is Apple. That Apple was is, is one of the rare companies that actually was a leader in the first wave and the second wave and potentially will be again in, in the third wave. And obviously it was founded by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak now 40 years ago. Uh, they were pioneers in, in in the early early days of personal computers. Kind of lost their way a little bit. You know, Steve Jobs got fired, and 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 that was that was part of it. There's some other issues going on. You know, he was kind of walking in the wilderness for a bunch of years. Kind of you know did uh, create another company next, and and acquired Pixar and some other things, and uh, and eventually came back to the company. When he came back to the company, he brought you know kind of a new perspective of, of not just about the vision of where this is going but a new appreciation for the dynamics around getting the right teams focused on the on the on the right products and and I remember when he called me when he went back into Apple must have been now 20 years or so ago uh, and at the time Apple had a 2% market share and most people were giving up for dead they said Apple was a pioneer in the in the personal computer era got left behind uh, is is now an irrelevant company and probably will go under uh, but he was able to take not just the, the 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 Apple brand, but some of the initial products they had and the, some of the people they had, and figure out a way to focus them partly by doing stopping some things that they were doing on a new set of, of products. And now Apple is one of the most valuable uh, technology companies in the world, and has has really had an enormous kind of you know resurgence. But part of what he's tried to do, particularly in the last decade, which I think was critically important because obviously he got you know, sick and, and sadly passed away, is how do you create a company that's not so much about Steve Jobs. It's more about Apple, uh, and that's tricky. Uh, and you know, the jury's out in terms of where they'll be five or ten years from now. But I think he did a great job of figuring out a way to institutionalize uh, some of the culture of Apple. Uh, so while, of course, you know, his his loss was a big loss to Apple, big loss to the world. That Apple is continuing to be an innovative company because it was beyond one person. But wait, you started this uh, anecdote by saying you remember when he called you. <laughs> so why did Steve Jobs call you? Well, at the time, AOL was the dominant internet company, and he wanted a partnership with us. Uh, he wanted us to develop a new version of our Macintosh software for uh, for uh, you know, to be supportive of the Macintosh, which was struggling, as I said, with, with this 2% uh, market share. And we ended up actually licensing our AIM technology to them to create a, 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 thing, a service, I think it was called iChat, which we'd never done before. You know, mm -hmm. So as a way to be, you know, try to be supportive of the, the rebirth of Apple. We, I remember having uh, you know, lunch with them a year or two later, uh, be, you know, when he was talking, uh, as probably a year before they launched uh, the iPod and iTunes, and talking about his view of digital music at the time, uh, we were, um, you know, but we'd already done the merger with Time Warner and and the Warner Music and and some of the assets we had there were very important to that. And we talked about working together on on uh, basically having AOL do the, the what became the iTunes Store, uh, which didn't end up happening. So yeah, you know, we we I was I was I wanted to be as supportive as I could of of the. Of the uh, of, of Steve's efforts to take this you know, turn the company around, to be honest, I, I I didn't expect him to have the success he did. It was much more of a of a turnaround than I than I would have imagined, and it just shows it's possible, uh, but it's hard. You know, so so you've been kind of at the ground floor of all these historical events in in technology over the next twenty years. I think that's you know not only did you call let's say the consumer internet in the late 80s that was going to happen over the next decade but then you sort of at the peak made the right decisions for your shareholders and investors and customers to kind of keep AOL sustainable and alive and with revolution you've done well now with this book the third wave you've outlined really what you see as the next trillion dollar opportunities and how people can get involved in it uh I, it was a great book because it interweaves again your personal story through it. So I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and, and talking about it. And, you know, are you, are you happy now? You've, you've been there, done it. You've, people have trashed you, have, have put you on the cover of Time Magazine, been across the whole spectrum. Are things good? No, How's things, life? Things are actually great. <laughs> I, 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 lo I love what I'm doing now. I have the opportunity to work with, with dozens of entrepreneurs at Revolution. I meet thousands of entrepreneurs around the country as these rise to rest efforts doing a lot of oh, great oh, things. Oh, and just to mention, like I have a friend who went to a startup weekend. You organize all these right. startup weekends. He said I learned, he learned more in a weekend than four years of college education. So I do see, again, in terms of education, these types of do-it-yourself events are almost better than 
four years of reading and being lectured to, you know, so kind of is an interesting thing about education, but, but, but go on. Yeah, I, I just enjoying what I'm doing, including what we're doing on with the case foundation. We really care about things like impact investing, you know, care about, you know, inclusive entrepreneurship. How do you kind of level the playing field? So everybody who has an idea has a, as a shot, I have the you know, gratified that people take my calls and listen to me in Washington. So I've been able to work together with Republicans and Democrats on you some went to high school with Barack Obama. I did go to high school. I was a senior when he was a freshman, so we weren't really in classes together. We played basketball a couple times, but I've now lived in Washington for thirty years and you know, with different administrations and different you know kind of you know kind of Republicans or Democrats kind of controlling the House or the, the Senate or the White House. And so I've tried to take a step back and not really focused on or engage in on politics, just focus on on policy. And I, I will continue to you know, to do that. So through revolution, investing in the next generation of, of entrepreneurs through the Case Foundation, trying to kind of level the playing field so that really opportunity is more broadly distributed and through some of the work on the policy, doing what I can to try to make sure we remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation. I, I'm having a ball and it's, it's fun to do it. And it's fun to actually finally write a book and, and have it out there that takes some of these ideas that I've been developing for the last 30 years, both the things that worked and, and, and why they worked and things that failed and why they failed. And hopefully that will be helpful uh, and instructive to the, the next generation of entrepreneurs, the next generation of innovators who really want to you know, take the internet to the next level in the, in the third way. Well, thanks again, Steve. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. It's fun. Yeah. Your daily dose of gaming just got way more epic with the Snapdragon processor powering the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. Snapdragon processors give you the premium mobile experience that triggers your inner champion whenever you want, wherever you want. Get ready for edge-of-your-seat performance, advanced customizations, ultra-realistic graphics, and adrenaline-boosting speeds that have the power to move you in more ways than one. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.